All right. So there's a particular question that has been bothering me for quite a while. So here's the question. Why are we living in a world like this? Out of all the possible universes that could exist, we seem to find ourselves in this one. Why? So we live in a universe with physical processes that run with law-like regularity. There's a clear cause and effect. There is some randomness and there's some mere correlation that exists in our universe, but there are causes with consequences. So why a universe like that? The initial moments after the Big Bang, they could have developed in any number of ways. And for whatever reason, they proceeded as it did. The universe expanded in such a way that made biological life possible. And we live in a world with all sorts of different kinds of biological organisms. The evolutionary process could have produced any number of creatures, and yet the universe contains certain biological organisms that we call humans. So again, I have to ask, why? And humans, they're, well, they're very interesting animals. They have a degree of rationality and autonomy that seems to outstrip the rest of the biological world. Humans are capable of complex emotional states, deep self-awareness, and goal-oriented actions. We seem to have this great power that we call free will, but why? So humans, as I see it, they are the glory and the garbage of the universe. So let me explain why why I think that. And I'll start with the glory. So humans are meaning-making creatures. They're curious by nature, constantly trying to make sense of everything. Humans are capable of developing deep loving friendships built on empathy and compassion. They can freely engage in altruistic behavior, create works of art, and investigate the mysteries of the universe. They can cultivate a field, a virtuous character, and a community. In other words, humans are able to use their their gift of free will to pursue truth, beauty, and goodness. And these are all glorious things. But remember, I also said that humans are the garbage of the universe. We live in a universe where there are significant consequences to our actions. We are able to harm others through actions based on ignorance and negligence. We can also harm others through deliberately willed malice and destruction. And humans are subject to temptation and weakness of will. Our rational self-interest can often turn into selfishness and greed. Humans can cultivate a killing field, a vicious character, and communities built on hatred. In other words, humans are able to use their gift of free will to pursue falsehoods, ugliness, and wickedness. So humans are the glory, but they are also the garbage of the universe. And this is the kind of world that we find ourselves living in. So I must ask my question again, why are we living in a world like this? Out of all the possible universes and all of the possible creatures that could exist, why a universe like this? And this is where the question of God typically enters into the story. So philosophers and theologians, they've long argued that God is the explanation for why there is a universe in the first place. But there are dissenting opinions. Some might concede that, you know, God is a natural explanation for why there's something rather than nothing. However, they might also argue that God could not produce a universe like the one we find ourselves in. They argue that there is some sort of contradiction between the nature of God and the nature of our universe. And this is because God is perfectly good and our universe is, well, our universe just has too much evil in it. Perhaps God could only you know, produce something that's perfectly good. Perhaps God could not possibly produce a universe like the one we find ourselves in. Maybe it's just logically impossible for God and evil to exist. And if that's right, the existence of evil that we see around us would give us good reason to think that God does not exist. And that's an interesting suggestion, and it's one that we will be exploring in this class. And here's how we're going to proceed. First, we need to investigate the different models of God on offer across the world's religions. In particular, we're going to be looking at classical theism, neoclassical theism, open theism, and panentheism. And each model of God will have different things to say about a series of questions that we need to address. And so here are two big questions that we're looking at in the class. So why would God create? And then why would God create this particular universe? And answering these two questions will shed some light on whether or not it is logically possible for God to create a universe with evil in it. Because if it is possible, answers to these questions will also help us figure out if we can expect God to create a universe with evil in it. So that's going to give you a glimpse of what we will be up to in this master's class. And so let me give you some examples so you can kind of get a better idea of what we're going to be exploring together. So in the Middle Ages, there's this Islamic philosopher named Al-Razi, and he said that there were five necessarily existent substances. 
These are God, the world soul, time, space, and prime matter. So Al-Razi, he says that God is perfectly rational and thus always acts for a reason. And then prior to the creation of the universe, God was, pre was presented with a constant succession of moments at which he could create. Now, since any of these moments is just as good as any other the, to create a universe, there is no reason to create the universe at any particular moment. And so Al-Razi concludes that a perfectly rational God cannot create the universe since God could not have a reason to create when he did. So why would God create anything at all? And Al-Razi's answer is that God does not create anything at all. Mm. Of course, you're probably wondering, how, how did this universe get here? Like, where did all this cosmic stuff come from? Well, Al-Razi is going to say, remember that world soul I told you about? That's another necessarily existent being. Well, the world soul is foolish, it's ignorant, and it's capable of making arbitrary actions. And so this world soul, it arbitrarily decided to create the universe at some random moment. And this world soul didn't really know what it was getting into. So according to Al-Razi, God foreknew this would happen. So God had planned on cleaning up the mess made by the world soul. So we just currently find ourselves in the midst of this mess. You might think that sounds crazy. Lots of people in the Middle Ages did say it was crazy. But Al-Razi is going to have a particular question for you. He's going to say, look at our universe. Does our universe really look like the product of a perfectly rational God? It wouldn't just make more sense if our universe was the product of a foolish soul. I, mean, I don't know how you feel about that. So let's consider some other possible theodicies. So here's another suggestion. This one comes from Leibniz. So Leibniz famously argued that a perfectly rational God would only be able to create the best of all possible universes. God's perfect goodness and rationality compel God to do the best. And there's only one universe that is the best. I mean, sure, there's like some bits and pieces of evil in the universe, but they form an organic unity with the universe as a whole, thus contributing to the overall greatness of our universe. So God's going to be justified in creating a universe with evil in it because this is the best of all possible worlds. That's one picture you could get. Not everybody's happy with this picture, though. So some philosophers, they argue that there just, there just is no such thing as a best possible universe. So saying that we're living in the best of all possible worlds, that just cannot be a justification for why God would create a universe with evil in it. Funny enough, though, the idea of a best possible world has made a really big comeback in recent years. So some contemporary philosophers like Class Cray and Hud Hudson, they argue that the best possible world is a multiverse that contains all of the possible kinds of goods imaginable. So God's justified in creating a multiverse that contains evil in it because that evil is significantly outweighed by all of the good that God has produced. But again, you might have some problems here. So to start, various people, they complain that a multiverse just by itself, that does not really help explain why God creates a universe with evil in it. If the idea is that the goods spread out across the multiverse outweigh the evils, that might still strike you as just a very poor theodicy. So for example, Marilyn Adams, she argues that God simply cannot just outweigh evils. That can't be enough. Instead, God needs to defeat evils. So God must guarantee that each of us has a life on the whole that is worth living. And if your life is on the whole just like really miserable, some unrelated goods in a different universe, that, that just doesn't seem to justify God in creating a world like this. At least that's how Marilyn Adams sees it. Here's another potential problem for these best possible world theodicies. So if God has to create the best, is God really free? So most theists worry that if God has to create the best, then God does not have free will. And that's going to be a problem because free will is a standard divine attribute. So it's typically taken to be a great making property. But a panentheist like Thomas J. Ord might say, eh, there's no problem here, no big deal. So in Ord's view, God's nature is essentially loving. Ord thinks that perfect love must create a universe of some sort. And on this panentheistic view, God has to create something. And then further, God's love is uncontrolling, which means that God must give creatures free will and God cannot override their freedom. All creatures, great and small, cannot be coerced by God in any way. God cannot single-handedly stop evil. At most, God can only try to persuade creatures to do the right thing and try to persuade creatures to like cooperate with God. And so for Ord, that explains why God must create in general. And it does seem like it gives like a, a partial explanation for why we're living in a world like this with evil and suffering. 
but then again, of course, not everyone's happy with this. Most think that God's freedom entails that God does not have to create anything at all, nor that God has to create anything in particular. And further, they think that God's uncontrolling love, that's just not enough to really explain why there's evil in the world. They'll say something about Ward's picture just seems a bit off, perhaps something non-rational about a God that just is just like metaphysically compelled to create all this stuff that does bad things and God just can't do anything about it. That seems like a weird and unfortunate world. Perhaps that's a really tragic world. So here's another kind of theodicy. One might say that God freely decides to create a universe so that creatures can enter into a genuine friendship with God. That gives God a reason to create. So that's, that's, that's good. But now we have to ask what kind of universe God would need to create in order to make friendship possible. So John Hick and Richard Swinburne, they give some interesting answers in this regard. So the idea is that God cannot enter into genuine friendship with just any kind of beings. God will need to create beings that have a certain degree of consciousness, freedom, and rationality that can enter into friendship. Also, these creatures, they need to have a particular moral character, because after all, no one wants to be friends with garbage people. You know, like you, you want to be friends with good people. So how's God going to pull that off? They say that God needs to create a particular kind of universe where creatures can perform free actions to cultivate a good moral character. And that will be a universe with uniform laws of nature so that creatures can perform actions with predictable outcomes. And then it also needs to be a universe with serious moral consequences for actions. Otherwise, the creatures cannot develop various virtue character traits like compassion, intelligence, bravery, and so on. And so as Hick and Swinburne see things, we should expect God to create a universe like the one we find ourselves in, because this is the kind of universe needed in order to build souls into the kind of people that can become friends with God. But then again, of course, not everybody's going to be happy with that. So people like Graham Oppie and Evan Fales, they think that if God exists, God would have to create better creatures from the start. And they don't think that God would create a universe like the one we find ourselves in. Instead, they think that a perfect God would create perfect creatures from the start. And since the creatures in our universe, they're far from perfect, there is a good reason to think that there is no God who created this universe. Personally, I struggle to make sense of this. It seems to me that Oppie and Fails are expecting God to do something that is metaphysically impossible. And so let me explain why I think this. So Oppie seems to be arguing that God would freely create beings ex nihilo with all of the perfections of the great making properties. And I, I just don't think that's possible. Here's why. So if God freely creates something ex nihilo, that being will begin to exist. Thus, that being will lack the perfection of eternality. And since God freely created this being, that being will also lack the perfections of necessary existence, aseity, and self-sufficiency. And I've barely begun my analysis, and I've already identified four perfections that, a per that no creature could have. So I have four reasons for thinking that Api is asking God to do something that is metaphysically impossible. But Evan Fales might be able to, you know, kind of help Alpi out here. He might say, well, let's make a weaker claim. Yeah, so Fales says that God cannot create beings with all of the perfections or great making properties, because any being that is caused to exist is going to lack aseity. So Fales thinks that God can create beings with all of the other great making properties, all the other perfections, except for aseity. Well, I already identified three other perfections that God cannot pass along to creatures. So, so Fales is going to have to make an even weaker claim. And I think, I think that's my guess is what Evan would do is because I think what Evan really wants to say is that God would create beings with omnipotence, omniscience, perfect moral goodness, perfect rationality, and perfect freedom. I think that's what Fales really wants to say. And so he's going to say, those are the kind of beings that we should expect God to create from the beginning. We don't see those kind of beings in this universe. So there probably is no God who created this universe. I think that's how the argument's supposed to go. Well, I don't think that God could create beings with those attributes from the start either. In fact, it seems impossible for God to create an omnipotent being. Anything that God creates will have its power dependent upon the will of God. And you're not all powerful if God could just let you slip out of existence or take away your power. And then further, it seems impossible for God to create beings with a perfect moral character and give them genuine freedom. If God creates beings with a fully determined moral character from the start, then they are determined by something external to only perform good actions. And a lot of philosophers want to say that that's just going to rule out free will. So I've just ruled out a few more perfections that God cannot pass along to creatures. And there's a lot more I could say, 
but I hope this just gives you a glimpse of what we're going to be exploring in this class, God, Freedom, and Evil. So thank you.